So welcome everyone. Um, I'm Chris Tichel and I'm hosting uh, this session. If you have any trouble with access, uh, shoot me an email at kkt7 at georgetown.edu. Um, and today we are uh, welcoming a, a presentation of four presenters uh, titled Building Global Legal Skills Through the Moot Court Experience. And um, I don't know if they're planning on introducing themselves, but I'll just uh, list. We have Lorene Contento, Diane Penny's Edelman, Rosa Kim, it's five people, excuse me, Hillary Reed and Hillary. Well, welcome everybody. Um, I turn it over to you. Yeah, thank you, and I'll start. So I just wanted to thank everybody for joining us and also, of course, thank the conference organizers for putting this biennial together virtually. Um, it's gone amazingly well so far and continued good luck. So today our panel is going to be discussing the many benefits and a few of the challenges, especially in these COVID times of the mood court experience. Um, I'm Lorreen Contento, and as you can see, the panelist slide showing that we also have Hillary Bell, Diane Edelman, Rosa Kim, Hillary Reed, all with extensive moot court and also international experience. And as we move through the presentation, if you could please use the chat function if you have questions, and then we'll hold, hold a Q&A at the end. And I did also want to mention that this presentation was an offering from the LWI Global Legal Writing Skills Committee, which Rosa and I co-chaired over the past two years. So my co-presenters are going to talk about the moot court's benefits and challenges, but before they do so, I wanted to highlight the increased interest in moot court experience abroad. And this is the piece of the presentation that really resonates with me because after nearly 20 years of teaching USJD students, I'm transitioning to teaching international LLM students and also foreign lawyers. And for the past 10 years or so, I've also done a fair amount of teaching abroad. And one thing that I've learned in that time <clears throat> is that while 25 years ago, legal skills training was rarely happening outside of the US, that's no longer true. And the moot court experience, because of the way it consolidates skills, is being embraced across the world. And so if you advance the slide. So, oops, nope, last one, I'm sorry. I wasn't paying attention. The, what, the previous slide, thank you. So in just a couple of stats. So the yearly Jessup International, um, International Law Moot Court Competition is the largest international moot in the world. And it started out as a very friendly little competition between two, uh, two US schools. But as popularity has really grown substantially over the years, both in the US and abroad. And in 2019, Jessup reported that nearly 700 teams from 100 countries and jurisdictions participated. The next logo is the Willem C. V's International Commercial Arbitration Mood held yearly in Vienna. Um, a sister of V's is also held in Asia every year. The first Vienna V's was held in 1994 with 11 schools and nine countries. And it also has um, grown steadily, but what's really striking to me is the nearly 30% increase in the number of schools part participating just since 2014. So another indication of how quickly skills training is advancing abroad. And then the third little, um, the globe, that just is, is something that's really interesting to me because the increase in moot court activity abroad isn't limited to just these super moots or ones like them. So last year, I did an informal survey of 60 international students, and over 50% reported that they had been involved in a moot court experience. But it wasn't all with the super moots like Jessup or V's. Um, in fact, many of the students were involved in local, national, or regional competitions that were hosted in their home countries or sometimes in countries that were near to them. I've also spoken recently with a former student in China. Um, his school in Beijing was one of the first to, um, to embrace moot court. Since then, they have um, built a moot court um, event space uh, host to, to host all the different moots. And he was reporting to me that China is now, really there's a, a lot of moot court competitions held solely in China for, for Chinese students. Um, Recently, too, I spoke with the dean of a school in Austria, 
his school uses mood quartz, mini moods, uh, both in orientation and also as a recruitment tool. And then just yesterday, a professor from the University of Ljubljana in Slovenia um, wrote to me. I think she might actually be here today. And she was telling me about her university's early participation with mood courts and how mood court has become such an essential part of her law school's curriculum. So all of this, yes, legal skills generally have been advancing uh, across the globe. Um, but interest in mood court is increase, increasing rapidly as well. I think because of the many benefits it brings to both students and coaches. And that's all I really have to say, just a little bit of background information. I'm going to turn it over to Rosa, who will discuss some of, some of the benefits. But first, the next slide. These are just a few images that Rosa found that helped to illustrate the mood court experience. The first is um, a poster from an international round of Jessup. The second um, shows you that the VIS competition is important enough to put on a mug. And the third shows how, uh, how, how impactful emotionally uh, participating in a mood court can be for students. And with that, I will turn it over to Rosa. Thank you so much, Lorraine. Uh, yeah, Jessup has the best posters. <laughs> Those of you who are, have been involved in, in, and this is really probably my favorite, um, and, and just a, a note about this, um, there are some really, really interesting topics um, of public international law that obviously um, that Jessup deals with. And on the commercial arbitration side, I'm not as familiar with those, but I just wanted to share with you very quickly next year's problem. How apropos, <laughs> um, you know, the problems are always extremely timely and relevant to what is happening in, in the world today. And so that the, the fact that this year, this coming year's problem is dealing with the global pandemic, et cetera, um, I think just speaks to that. Um, so uh, before, um, let me just move to uh, kind of a, our roadmap slide. Um, so, I mean, why are we even doing a, a whole conversation and presentation about moot court? Um, I think it's one of those topics that if you have ever been involved in it, um, then you know sort of why <laughs> we're talking about it. Um, but it is really a, a, a kind of an amazing vehicle, I think, um, for delivering uh, legal skills to students, whether they are USJD students or international students. And so, so I'm going to deal with the, I love the color coding. I had to do it for myself and force everyone else to come along with me, but I'm going to be dealing with the M of moot, which um, I think a really good word for, for the, to, to kind of encapsulate my piece is that it really is a microcosm of legal practice skills. Um, and then uh, the, uh, the first O, Diane's going to talk about all of the opportunities that uh, moot court competition teams create for students and honestly for faculty too um, who are teaching or coaching. And then um, Hilary B is going to talk about the sort of overseas perspective, what it's like to participate from uh, outside of the U.S. and also the online experience, frankly, this year. Um, I know that she coached a team that was online and with, with all of the pros and cons that that brings. And then finally, um, Hilary R is going to talk about how transformative um, participating in moot court can be for students. And she also has some other uh, kind of words of, of caution for those who may be running the programs as well. So uh, let me get started with um, my my piece on why I think uh, moot court competition programs or courses are really a microcosm of legal practice skills. Um, I, I think this idea came to me really in a, in in stark you know um, uh, in, in an enhanced quality when I put together a two week um, sort of workshop for Spanish law students on um, preparing them to compete in a moot court. Um, and this is something that I just designed the course in talking with the school. Um, these are the skills that they wanted their students to have. 
Um, and that's the same as, as Lorraine was saying, many students around the globe are looking to develop these kinds of skills, uh, whether it's through a moot court or just um, generally speaking. But um, certainly it encapsulates the practice and professional skills kind of in a self-contained way. And that's what I really um, realized in a two-week course to actually teach research analysis, synthesis, um, writing, drafting, um, and then finally oral advocacy, doing all of that in a two week span, it's a lot. Uh, and I think it can only be really be done in an intensive format, but, but it really um, uh, brought home the, the, the importance of, or at the convenience actually, the efficiency of doing it this way. Um, so the first week I actually devoted to the research and writing aspect. I had kind of mini Jessup memorials. I worked on a mini Jessup memorial and had them due at the end of the week, the first week. And then I, I prepared them for um, oral advocacy during the second week. The final day of that second week, we did a, a whole mock trial uh, and I got to wear the whole European style garb playing the judge. Uh, so that was a lot of fun. Um, and it really just, you know, obviously was it was a great experience to cap off the two week exercise. But I think I, I really, it forced me in teaching this course to really boil down, you know, the, the core skills. If you only have a limited of t amount of time to teach these skills, how do you do it? What is the best way to do it? And of course, I use much of my material, both from my first year legal writing course and from the advanced uh, legal writing course that I, I also teach, um, really sort of chose the best elements to bring home these, these skills in a, in, in, a, in a short span. Now, I will say that the Jessup uh, arc is much longer. It is not a two-week exercise by any means, as, as those of you who've been involved know. It's more like a five, five month and longer if you're lucky enough to go to the international round, but it's a very long commitment. Um, but in, and so there's obviously a, a ton of opportunity to develop these skills and hone them even, even uh, more finely. Um, and it, it, on the other side, um, meaning the professional side, I think these are almost as important, if not maybe even more in some ways, because as, as everyone knows, it, it's, it's hard to collaborate. It's hard to live with, with the team for a long time, or actually even a short time, as in the workshop that I did. Um, people will disagree on how best to do things. You know, what's our strongest argument? Who should go first? How long should we spend on the survey? But all, all of these questions are, are ones that have to be worked out as a team. And so I think there is a huge um, value in the, the skills that, that students learn in co collaboration and working as a team. Um, I had in, in, the, in the, the team that I had this past year, one of the team members suddenly couldn't carry her load, <laughs> which is tricky. Um, I did have a fifth member, um, luckily this year, uh, and of council. And as soon as that, that student you know, could no longer uh, work, it really put everybody into a panic for, for a little bit. But having to work around that and having to kind of rise to that challenge, I think was one of the best learning experiences, at least for, for my team this year. So collaboration, following instructions and deadlines, this is a really important one, right? If you don't follow the, the parameters for submission, you get penalized and you have to leave, live with the penalties. Um, so it's real, it makes it very real. And, and you know, I've been on teams where students have forgotten to do things or have left track changes on their documents and have paid the price, but it is a really great lesson to learn. Um, and then giving and receiving feedback, this is, this is also huge in the sense that um, not only are they getting feedback from the coaches and from all of the guest judges that we have, but really from each other. How do you give constructive and receive, you know, give constructive feedback and receive it openly with grace, right? And, and these are all things that, that obviously are going to be important on the job as lawyers in any work situation. Um, and then finally, the networking piece. Um, you know, the, 
actually going to the the, the regional uh, competition, which of course is the kind of the payoff at the end of all the hard work, you really meet some amazing people. We always go to the one in New York, the Northeast, and you know you get a chance to actually talk to judges and coaches and fellow students from from other um, uh, schools. And that's also an important skill. How do you present yourself when you are talking to um, you know a UN official or just another professor uh, of international law or a practitioner with whom you may stay in touch and actually network for a job later. Um, I, I've seen these kinds of things happen, you know, come to fruition. So it's, it's an amazing opportunity for students, I think, to um, see the, 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 the greater network of, uh, of folks who are really interested, not only in the kind of the competition aspect, but also in international law, public international law, because they may not be seeing that in their own schools. Um, in some schools, it is a huge, it's, it's, a, it's a much sort of lauded aspect of their curriculum or co-curriculum, but in other schools, it plays a, a sort of a smaller role. And when it does, you don't realize that other people are as passionate about international law as you are. So it's good to kind of see that, that you know, there are certainly uh, like-minded folks out there. Um, and it does build an incredible community uh, of um, folks who not only during the process, but really for the rest of their lives to kind of have this become a member of the family of, of um, Jessup in, you know, in, in my case. But I guess maybe that would be a good time to pass this over to Diane in, in terms of talking about those kinds of opportunities and communities. Thanks, Rosa, and thanks everybody for joining us. Um, for those who, who don't know me, um, probably like the other speakers and many of you, uh, my perspective is just of someone who is obsessed with the uh, relevance of international and comparative law for lawyers everywhere, whether they're abroad or here in the US. My basic, basic feeling is whether you never leave Philadelphia or Chicago or wherever else you're practicing, or whether you are abroad, you need to have perspective on international and comparative legal issues. You may have clients abroad, you may have, uh, uh, you may, you may have there may be clients uh, abroad who have interest in the US, or you may have US clients with interest abroad, and they could involve anything from adoption to tax to litigation, real estate to corporate. And I think we only gain from this knowledge, especially in a world like today where we're gonna have some unique challenges to communicating internationally, teaching and studying internationally as well. So I do have some overlap with Rosa. When I do, I'm gonna try and just zip through it to get to some other parts. Um, it, in terms of these opportunities, obtaining in-depth exposure uh, to concepts. By in-depth, I also mean intensive. Whenever students are studying international legal concepts, it's a whole new uh, legal, international as an in international court of justice, like the Jessup or the Lease. It's a whole new legal system. And comparative law, when you're looking at the laws of France or Ghana, or Chile or whatever, You're, you may be dealing with other languages and other legal systems as well. Um, if you happen to be blessed to be multilingual or bilingual, you even have more opportunities and it's something we should encourage with our students who um, are multi or bilingual. But in any event, the, the, the in-depth exposure is actually intensive because if you're working on a short-term project such as some of the ones Rosa mentioned, you're doing this work very intensively. If you're working on the Jessup, it's practically a year long um, experience. Um, we gain a lot of perspective on our own legal systems. So I'm, I'm, this is not just opportunities for students, it's opportunities for us as well. So for example, if I've given students a problem on international aspects of capital punishment or the immunity of government officials, I've had students come to me and say, hey, you know, I didn't know that all these different countries had different viewpoints on capital punishment, or I didn't know they treated consular or diplomatic or embassy officials in different ways. And it's been so exciting and rewarding to get those kinds of 
of questions and, and be able to discuss them. Um, in terms of observing highly trained opposing counsel, I'm talking about students facing tr highly trained um, students from other countries and from the US. These folks are going to be their colleagues later on or opposing counsel or judges or arbitrators um, or people who call them and say, I remember you from way back when, when we did so well in the Jessup or the Vise as opponents. Well, now I have a client who has an interest in your jurisdiction. And I just thought, and I read about you on the web, on your firm's website, and I thought I'd start with you. These things happen. In terms of the observing, observing behavior of and obtaining guidance from judges, um, uh, Rosa talked a little bit about the guidance that you get. And uh, it, it is something to be paid attention to by students and also is a networking. You make a great impression upon a judge in a competition, a judge from England, you can reach out to that judge at some po appropriate point in the future to network or, or look for a clerking opportunity or that sort of thing, if it's an actual judge or if it's a law firm to work with that firm or organization. And as you may know, you probably have had this feeling that when former students reach out to you or when they reach out to alumni of your school, you and the alumni are very touched and kind of flattered by that. So you know, that I think that's a very natural human reaction and students can make that impression if they make keep these relationships with judges. In terms of behavior of judges, some judges are very you know, proper and others can be very aggressive and some can be completely quiet on the bench. And if you prepare students for dealing with all of them, you're also helping them prepare for the clients and lawyers they're gonna be dealing with in practice who have different personality traits and it helps make them resilient, which is something we all need. Um, st also, students who study abroad from your schools can participate in moot court teams abroad. I have a student who studied at Edinburgh and was on an intellectual property moot and a student who went to um, Leiden for a year and participated in the VIS in the year that they won. So even if they may not have that opportunity at home, they might have it abroad. Um, next slide, please. Okay, so again, confident speaking skills. I mean, I never thought I could speak to a classroom, much less be in a competition or be a litigator. Um, I did the Jessup back a thousand years ago in law school, and every time I practiced, the judges asked different questions and caught me up on different things. And it was actually in the car ride on the way to our regional that I found my voice and did very well in the competition. And I try and share that with students so that you know, they know that this is a process. They get lots of writing experience and lots of revision experience that they should um, make personal traits for all the work that they do. They build connections we've talked about. Um, we learned that we're not so different than others. And here I just wanna tell you about something that I'll mention at the end of our slides. Three years ago, I had the opportunity to go to Moscow. This is after our 2016 election. I was a little nervous and I thought going to Russia, this is a place where my family has roots, where I never thought I would go, but I was invited to teach oral argument to Russian law students at the Pericles Law Project in Moscow by Marion Dent, an American who has lived there for 20 years and teaches, runs a Jessup summer school. So as you saw, um, I, uh, Lorena Rosa showed you um, the slide for the Jessup problem for the coming year. They used to not announce that till the fall, but now they announce it in the spring. So what does the Pericles Law Project do? It creates a Jessup type problem using those issues, even though the real Jessup problem won't be out until the fall. So it creates a problem using the pandemic, using the other couple of issues that were mentioned on that slide. And it has a two week summer school where students from all over Russia, I think it's about 30 some this year, and they're doing it online instead of in person, of course, where they study oral argument 
legal writing, um, English skills, um, a little bit more about international law so that they're prepared to go to the Jessup. And every year, a dozen or so of these students come to Washington for this. Um, so I'm more than happy to talk to people about that. I'm running out of time. So the only other thing I'll mention is that I have taught international law, moot court style, in legal writing classes at my school. And I have lots of problems that are both appellate style and motion style that I'm happy to share. And at the end, you'll see it. Hopefully, we'll have time for the slide from the Paraclete students. Thanks. Thank you, Diane. Um, I am a professor in Qatar. As my accent gives away, I'm not from Qatar. I am Scottish, for those of you who don't know me. Um, I have been in Qatar for eight years. For six of those, I have taught legal writing and coached moot court. I have taken seven teams to international finals, which would be a really good brag if I was coming from the States and I got through to the finals every year, but we're often the only team from the country in the competition, so um, it's a bit of a given, but still had the wonderful opportunity to do that. I love this slide. When this meme was sent to me during this, this year I coached the VIS competition, it brought tears to my eyes because Vindabuna Zinubia, if you don't know the VIS competition, is, um, represents Vienna in the competition. It's always the seat of the VIS arbitration. I believe the root is the Roman name for Vienna. But this sense of identity, this sense that I belong, that moot court transcends national boundaries and nationality, and that this is who I am, I am a mootie, or I am a moot coach. I think it really captures the magic of moot for me. Um, Lorene mentioned earlier about the Viz mug. The Viz mug has been one of my real concerns around the pandemic. I was like, am I not going to get my Viz mug this year? Because these are things that I really treasure. I love my moot court swag. Um, and if I don't get my Viz mug, I'm going to be quite upset, shall we say. Just following on Diane's point about networking, even if your students haven't met a judge or an arbitrator or a member of a law firm, if they can identify on LinkedIn that that person has taken part in moot court, it is an amazing conversation starter, an amazing opener for students um, to start a conversation, even if they're at a networking event, and just say to that person, oh, you're a mooty. It just opens up a whole world of magic and memories for anyone who's been involved in moot court. You know, the Nubia is in my heart, you know, or Andachenko, Ruduruku, any of the Jessup um, places that have taken place. Um, there was a, the Academic Bridge Programme runs from Pittsburgh Law School um, and the Department of Commerce in the US come every year for the last 10 years to the Middle East and operate a pre -moot. They put all the Middle Eastern teams in touch with each other, we train together and they run a pre -moot. And this year they amazingly made it happen online with two weeks, two weeks to organise it. It was amazing. They said they weren't sure if they could do it and the quote at the end was, luckily for us, we underestimated the immense spirit of the team and the programme itself. It is real and infinite. And to me that captures the spirit of Moot Court. On the trophy each year that's awarded to the winner, um, sorry, can we go to the next slide? I apologise. This is the quote at the bottom of the screen is the quote that's on the Albert Kritzer trophy. And it's people, we have created you all, male and female, and made you nations and tribes so that you would recognize each other. And that brings me to my sort of pet learning outcome from Moot Court is to try and instill some cultural competence learnings in the students. If you're able to travel to the international rounds of the competition, it almost happens by osmosis. The students are so immersed in dealing with teams from completely different cultures, with different personal styles and with different styles of competing. Their oral arguments are very different. You can tell normally if a 
team is from an inquisitorial background or if they come from um, if they come from an adversarial system. So if you're in the international rounds of the competition, it becomes very clear the differences. And peer learning is something that doesn't always happen. You know, it's a given in education that you will have learning from your instructor and that you'll have um, learning from the topic, but not always peer learning isn't always guaranteed. Um, but in the moot court competition, you will be exposed to different styles. If we can move to the next slide. Um, I know legal systems aren't necessarily culture, but it can be a very good starting point uh, to analyse different communication styles in different cultures. And a very good exercise that you can do that's a paper-based exercise in cultural competence. Um, and this can be done in the first weeks of the semester because the moot problems aren't often released until maybe week four or five. So you have a few weeks that you could do this, front load this, and that's look through um, VIS, and VIS use the CISG, which is internationally applied, but in individual jurisdictions. So you can look at CISG case law, which sets out how the pleadings have been set out by council. So if it's a judgment, say from Germany, and it's an inquisitorial civil law system, you can see how the advocates have made up the argument, how they have synthesized the civil law into an argument for CISG. You can also see how the judges have approached dealing with the matter in an inquisitorial manner. And your students can critique between the system that they know. Obviously, if you're teaching civil law students, you can look at common law um, decisions. Also, another paper-based exercise, you can look through um, the memorials online that are available from previous competitions that are models of excellence that have done well. So even if you're not traveling to the international rounds, and even if you're not taking part in the competition, there are still resources available that you can look at to identify how different legal systems operate. If you do go to the international rounds, preparing the students for the different styles of um, inquisitorial judges can be helpful because if you sit in front of an arbitrator or a judge who's from that system and you're overly aggressive um, and zealous in your advocacy, it's not necessarily going to go well. So training the flexibility to you don't know who your judge is going to be till you get to the court, which is almost always true of court appearances, that you can have that flexibility to change style depending on what the judge is indicating they would prefer. And this year, we, um, if we can move on to the next slide, thank you. So this year, we had to move to the online competition um, for the finals, but I wanted to first of all talk about our experience in the pre moot because that was our, our first experience of it. We were not allowed to take part in the pre moot competition in the Middle East this year because for the past three years, we have lived under an air, land and sea blockade within the region. So we've not been able to travel um, to any of the, well, the majority of the countries in the Middle East. And so we were barred from taking part in the regional collaboration. As a result of the competition transitioning online, we were able to do that, which was wonderful. Within two weeks, they were able to organise a competition with 28 teams, 150 advisors from 17 different countries. The weaknesses for our team this year, we were all living under curfew, so none of us could leave and go out. We couldn't meet with one another, which is very difficult when teams were operating in a co-council. They couldn't have their co-council next to them. They couldn't share the documents and folders, which is usual in moot court. We were operating from a huge number of time zones, and we had a huge number of technical difficulties, as set out or indicated in the previous slide. Um, the opportunities of online, particularly for teams who are not able to travel, and Hilary's going to talk about that a little more, the challenges of travelling, particularly internationally, in a moment. But I love the Confucius quote, I hear and I forget, I see and I remember, I do and I understand. You can have a very rewarding moot court experience online. It's a slightly different experience. And while you don't have the same immediacy for cultural competence lessons, it is possible to do them with intentionality um, and the potential is still there. 
Um, what came to mind when Rosa was talking about one of the challenges of somebody not being able to carry their load, I remembered that a team two years ago for Jessup, two members of the team came down with typhoid and were unable to travel. Mm -hmm. It was, um, and they were able, they were resilient, they managed to get some things online. But of all the things you worry about as a moot court coach, and they are almost infinite, I've never even thought to worry about my team coming down with typhoid. So it goes to show, or that there was going to be a global pandemic and we wouldn't make it to Vienna. But um, thank you for your time. She's so cute. I really like her. What is her name? All right, so I'm going to talk about how this is transformative for students, but it can be tricky to administer. Um, you've actually heard quite a few moments of those transformative uh, student situations, the cross-cultural learning opportunities, um, the exposure to international judges and arbitrators. So a little bit about me and my moot court background. I um, was at Pepperdine until 2017, and while there, I directed both the um, National Moot Court Program and the International Moot Court Program. So I had the opportunity to see how our students were, um, you know, often, particularly our American students, because we did have some international students who participated in our international moots as well, but our American students you know, in an American law school, it is possible to have a very American uh, law-centered experience. That's what many of them have. And so if you stay in the national moot court system, you're used to American-style judging, American-style uh, communication. And so these international competitions open up students' eyes to how things are done capably and wonderfully in other parts of the world that are just different than how they might have been exposed to up until this point. So that's, that was a huge component of how transformative it was for students. Um, we've talked some about the team dynamics. You know, I teach 1L uh, lawyering skills as well, and we do often have some team projects that are shorter term, but these international moots, as Rosa mentioned, these go on for months, some spanning nearly a year. And so you have to be able to manage conflict and um, figure out how to move past potential conflicts. Um, there have been moments in coaching and administering competitions that I felt a little bit like a relationship counselor. Um, I, I'm sure I, I'm seeing nods of, a, <laughs> of agreement where, you know, you have students who are having a really hard time getting along or uh, getting the job done and figuring out how they can move through that. And that's an important skill. And uh, getting to see them do that has been really wonderful. Um, the world cl class competition, I know um, our students were really well prepared and then they would get to competitions and realize, wow, how well prepared uh, all the teams from all over the world, whether we were at VIS or the um, Foreign Direct Investment Moot, um, just how hard all the teams have been working. And for our American students, realizing how, how much harder the students from other countries where English is not their first language is, and just kind of recognizing and appreciating uh, all of the different contributions for each of the teams that are getting there and what it's taking for them to get there, which leads to the final one, getting to go really amazing places, um, whether it's Hong Kong or Vienna, um, whether, you know, I, I got to take a team to um, Buenos Aires. So getting to do this world-class travel for the students, it is an absolutely incredible opportunity. Now, um, you know, as we were preparing for this, thinking through what it would be like uh, to have prepared and then have to shift online. Certainly there's disappointment in that, but uh, just knowing how amazingly it did go. I spoke yesterday uh, to some moot, moot court students and I'm now at University of Houston and I was talking to national moot court students, but they just had the best attitude of whether it's online or in person, the valuable experience that they're getting through these programs. So um, I've been really impressed with our students' attitudes um, about that.
Next slide, please. So from the side of working with administration and figuring out how to make all this happen, uh, maybe that's something that's relevant to you. Maybe it's something that's somebody else's issue at your school. But I will say if you're thinking like, wow, how can we make this happen and do more international experiences for our students? The first thing um, to think through is where's the money going to come from? Because when we're not in a pandemic doing these competitions online, uh, if we're actually traveling to the competitions, I know uh, uh, when I was running this, it was probably three to four times more expensive, at least every time we were thinking about doing some sort of international competition versus um, a national competition. And when we're thinking through how many students are going to be able to take part in this opportunity, how much per student does that cost, um, being involved in an international program just does increase those costs. I think thinking creatively about how to deal with that expense is a great thing, um, whether you can get sponsorships from law firms. I know I had students who were able to um, get their employers to help sponsor them as they were going through it, working with institutes within your institution to figure out how to partner together to help um, underwrite some of those costs can also really help so that you have uh, the ability to send to these amazing competitions. I also know we sometimes had challenges with how to select the teams when we had students who were very interested in international law but didn't have much advocacy experience or we had students who were excellent advocates who had been involved in um, other moots or maybe done advocacy even prior to coming to law school. You know, which, which cohort would create the best team? And, and I would say from my experience, and I'd of course be interested in hearing others, but often some of our best teams were the ones that had a mixture of students who had that international experience and then also um, the advocacy experience. And then finally, um, especially if you have a team that has a lot of people who have some advocacy skills but maybe don't have the international law experience, uh, they really need experienced coaches because there is a very high learning curve to uh, enter these competitions and figure out how they're run and just they're, they're well-oiled machines and they work in very specific ways. So getting former Moody's who have been to the competitions, uh, it's an invaluable way that you can have your alums be a resource to you. Uh, it will be very difficult for your students to just figure this out without really experienced guidance from um, their coaches and from the program as a whole. So that I think from me, we're moving forward into some student testimonials. Oops, trying to advance. Um, I just want to thank you, Hillary. I just wanted to, um, and what you said at the end there just really segues into the test, the first testimonial here, which is from the team member that I had this past year who had zero background in international law, but she was so dedicated and she really wanted to work on her, not only her skills, but learn a whole new area of the law. And, and this is, I mean, I, she wrote a very long uh, reflection, actually, that was very moving and personal. And I just took this part out, which really, just to show you what an impact this had on her. She really did not see things the same way. I mean, she's not seeing the world the same way now as she did before, Jessup. And this is kind of exactly the kind of reaction I would want from students who come into the process not really knowing what they're getting into, but then end up having really, really being transformed by the experience. So it was just, it was an amazing thing to see her transformation from being a complete not even novice, just not really knowing anything to hearing her argue, uh, you know, at the competition with so much confidence and, and knowledge about international law. So I just wanted to share that. The next testimonial is from one of my students of Chicago, Kent, and he took a very practical approach, 
what he got out of his, um, he's a, from Ukraine, but what he got out of his moot court experience was that it was a benefit to him overall because it put him well above other candidates when he was, was searching for a job. So that was, that was his main takeaway, although learning about international, um, international law and cultural competency also is important. The top testimonial here was one of my um, students from this, this year. She's an exceptional student. Her mother is from Indiana and her father is Custody and she has lived her whole life here but if you meet her and see her she is the all-american girl the accent the attitude and when we were in the pre this year we went to Bosnia and um, the Eastern European very direct style and comments on personal clothing did not land well with my students and she says I was put in uncomfortable situations where I had to maintain composure and take one for the sake of the team and that really impacted on me. It really did. Moot helped me distance myself from what's going on, more so than classroom learning. And I'll leave it at that so we have time for the others. Um, thanks. The final one is from a student at another law school at Drexel Law in Philly, whom I coached a few years ago on Jessup. Um, he did a great job. He really appreciated, even though we weren't abroad or anywhere outside of Philly, um, the, the exposure that he got to other cultures and, um, and you know, the leadership skills he developed, I can only help, uh, helped instigate him starting his own law firm right after law school, which has been very successful. And then... I'm going to stop sharing my screen. Diane, do you want to play the... Yep, I'm going to give it a try for a couple of minutes. Um, folks, let me just mention back again about the, the Pericles experience in Russia. I encourage you, if you get to know people in other countries who are interested in developing Jessup schools or these schools or that sort of thing, um, you, can, you can help them do that. And it creates an opportunity for their students as well as for you to perhaps teach them. And even though, for example, the uh, Pericles is online this summer, I may be doing some judging remotely, which is really pretty neat, and other folks have done that as well. Uh, going to Russia was an incredibly eye-opening experience, and without saying more, let me try and correctly share this screen with you. I see Hillary's fingers are crossed. So someone give me a thumbs up if uh, this is working. Students from cities all over Russia and even all right, so I would like to say hello to uh, Diane Edelman and everybody at the conference. Uh, my name is Marion Dent, and I've been um, teaching law in Russia and running this Jessup Moot Court summer school for the past 10 years in Russia. And this year we're doing it online with students from cities all over Russia and even outside of Russia in Belarus, Tashkent, and even one student from China. So I'd like everybody to say hello. And first we have Dmitry Mednikov, who has been um, with us for many years and um, moot courting made his career. So just say hello, Dmitry. <laughs> <clears throat> hello, Diane. Uh, so uh, in, in terms of how uh, mooting has helped my career, my first job offer came from Grigory Vipen, uh, <laughs> whom I have um, had known by then to be a judge and a fellow competitor in Jessup. And um, when he offered me the job in, in an NGO that, uh, in which he worked at the time, his exact words were, it's like Jessup. And this is basically what made me decide to work with him for, um, I believe it was three years. And those were one of the best uh, years of my life and one of the best teams that I've ever worked in. Thank you, Dimitri. Uh, we have now our current students. We have Vlada Minkova. Do you want to introduce yourself? 
Um, hello, my name is Rada. I am from Piatigorsk. I've participated in the Jessup competition twice and uh, next year with the third time. And I want to say that each time uh, when I participate, it's different competition because when I started it, I didn't realize uh, what I was searching for and it was really difficult. And after that, uh, the second time, I started to understand the system, how it works, and uh, now I even can uh, see uh, the points that uh, differ from the teams that are the highest, and I hope that the third time would be uh, much better than the others. Thank you. Thank you, Vlada. And now we have Golnoza Mama Dalieva, if I'm pronouncing that right. Yes, uh, to introduce yourself. <laughs> Hi, everyone. Glad to see you. So I'm Gunnoza from Tashkent, uh, specifically Uzbekistan. And all like uh, I'm just finishing up my first year at Tashkent Law University. And uh, also it will be just my first year at competing in Jessup. I'm really proud that I got somehow a little bit of experience during my first year while we were uh, in a supplementary team, which was helping our main team to compete in the Jessup. Thank you, Gulnoza. And now we have Archom Arutunyan. Can you? Oh, yeah, yeah. That, that might be how, how to pronounce. Um, hello, Dan. And I just wanted to bring up a story of my first impression of Jessup. I mean, when we came to Moscow to participate, uh, I had some thoughts maybe that wouldn't fit for me, maybe that would. I didn't know. But after my first trial, I was judged by Mr. Cook and by Mr. Fludas, and they completely destroyed me. But then, after the court, uh, they gave us a 200% motivation. Like Dimitri said, um, we need that black horses, like regional teams, to participate and to compete with uh, Moscow teams and some stuff. So it inspired me a lot and I like international law a lot. So that's why we're here. Thank you. And finally, we have Hai Feng Sun, who goes by the name of Bachelor. Uh, will you speak? Hey guys, I'm Bachelor. I'm a graduate student from Nanjing University and I major in American politics. Um, I believe that Mm, how to say it? Um, I want to build a just and fair international order. So I believe this order is in the form of international law. So that's why I'm joining you to study it. Um, I believe it's a great competition. So, and you know, it's kind of a group of people joining together for a better dream or something that you can sharpen yourself. I mean, it's. It's like an um, improving process. I'm really looking forward to join it. Thanks, Dan. Okay, thank you, everyone. Uh, please wave goodbye. Okay, and thank you, Diane. Bye bye. Phew. <laughs> Yay, it worked. <laughs> I'm glad it worked. We've tried that was great, Diane. many yeah. things, but I, the students are so. I mean, there they are. They're all over the country, but they're engaged with one another and what they are learning. And when you see this, you feel hopeful. So thank, thank you. Thank you, everyone, for joining us. I think that that does it for us. And thanks for hanging on for a couple, couple minutes over. Um, we, by the way, um, each of us, we are happy to talk to you. Um, you know, privately, if you have questions about either developing a, a course or coaching a team, um, we would uh, welcome your questions. I don't know whether there were any questions, Hillary R., that we know. <laughs> okay. I'll just want to, to um, advise people, if you're interested in coaching a team or even doing practice rounds, uh, send a note to the ILSA uh, office and they'll put you in touch with a team that that doesn't have a coach or that needs practice round judges thank you mark yeah ilsa.org 
All right. Terrific. Well, thank Great. you to thank you to all our presenters. This is really interesting and very, very hopeful. <laughs> <laughs> Feel good. Um, thank you so much for sharing that expertise and thank you all for attending. Um, I'm going to end the meeting in a minute. So uh, this just as a reminder, these sessions have been uh, recorded and then they'll be posted and available on our website as soon as uh, Kim and, and her crew can get that all together. So thanks everyone. Have a wonderful afternoon. Chris. Thanks, Chris. Chris, Hi, there's, Chris been thanks. there's been a yes. question whether we yes. can just linger on for a little bit if, for a few people who may want to discuss something. Absolutely. Yes, I will absolutely leave that open. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so, so I just, I, I had a question that, can you hear me? Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so, so one of the things that occurred to me, um, and I was, I was hoping to get your input, when I think about the Jessup and the Vise competition, um, and the fact that one is located in Europe and one is located in the United States, it kind of tied back to one of the comments that uh, one of Marion's students made about the necessity of having these dark horses from the provinces participate in the Moscow competition. And I'm wondering if you get any sense of how the actual places, assuming you know we go back to a world where we're not meeting virtually, how the actual um, location of where these competitions takes place impacts on those students who are coming from outside, whether respectively the US or, or Europe, and whether the competitions themselves should, during the competition, make some acknowledge, acknowledgement of the diversity. And I know Jessup has their national ball um, which is one way it's inherent in the power structure of it. Uh, can you hear me now yeah so I'm, I'm just wondering whether there there is anything of inherent in the structure of the organizations that almost acts as a kind of like in some some respects it's cultural imperialism because of where the competitions take place and if there's ever been any interest or or desire to to impact that or change change the the subconscious um imbalance that occurs when one country is always the host wow i mean it's such an interesting question yeah and I'll, I'll defer to to somebody else very quickly but i just wanted to give you a little bit of perspective about the 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 sense that i got when i was in spain teaching this this one at this one particular school in madrid um they had participated in maybe a, like a european competition but the first thing they said to me was well it's always you know this school and this school who are going to end up competing in other words that there there was kind of you know the really well established programs in in spain for example were the ones who were just kind of obviously going to, going to go far in the competition so the fact that this this school really didn't have a program i mean it, and many schools like it didn't don't have programs kind of just speaks to i think that the, the programs have just gravitated to certain schools or have really been you know taken on or taken seriously or well funded or whatever by certain schools and that kind of creates you know the the activity uh, around Jessup in in that region or or in that country so i just found it interesting um and so one of the things that they were looking for was i mean they wanted to to compete but they didn't really have the skills they didn't know how to acquire the skills to be competitive uh, and so um, I was kind of filling that gap and they were actually in the class there were not only students but law professors or other professors who were kind of interested in coaching future teams. So that's another kind of demographic that we might think about when we kind of go out into the world and maybe give workshops or teach that if we're teaching the coaches you know that can obviously generate more um, ability for for these schools or other programs to continue to um, have moot court. So that's just a little perspective from Spain. And I just wanted to mention really quickly because the the statistics really show a huge increase in participating schools and countries over the last fifteen to twenty years. 
So I, I, I wonder if, um, I don't, I don't know, I wonder if things will change on their own just because of the influx of, of new countries participating and new schools. And I don't know if I, we have Anna Vlahek here from um, University of Ljubljana. Anna, I don't know if you'd like to speak on, on that at all about whether there's some kind of a cultural barrier maybe because of where the competitions are held. Thank you so much uh, for having me. Um, well, our university, University of Ljubljana, has been participating in moot courts since the early 1990s, I guess. So um, I was participating at VIS, for example, in 2002 and at CMC in 2003, CMC meaning Central and East European Moot Court Competition, like a small sister of the uh, uh, renowned ELMC competition. Um, and for the last 20, almost 30 years now, our university uh, has been really active in moot court uh, participation from Jessup, VIS, uh, René Cassin, ELMC, CMC, lots of um, uh, other smaller regional moot courts as well. Um, we've actually never had any financial problems regarding um, this participation. If I refer to um, Hilary Reed, uh, who said that that might be a problem for some teams, um, because uh, in Slovenia we have, uh, actually we have a um, uh, state fund that finances our students. So every, basically everyone can apply for each of uh, the competitions and they get funds, enough funds to cover, basically cover all the costs. Um, That's amazing. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, if, 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 if we require uh, more, more funds than we just apply to our faculty and our management um, is really keen in assisting us in that. Or we ask if it is necessary, um, uh, the law offices. And in Slovenia, uh, actually, um, I think I, this is um, the case for the majority of, of the states. Um, the, the best law offices um, recruit uh, former mutis. Uh, if you have, um, um, well, if, if you write in your CV that you were an active moot court participant, and in particular, if you scored well, if your team scored well, then um, this is a really, really uh, good basis for, for, for a job interview. Um, so um, as, in, as the best law offices uh, employ former mutis, they all, uh, know about the moot courts and they also finance them if required, if we ask them uh, for, for, for the funds. Um, so in, in terms of the finances, we, we've never had any, any particular problems. Um, uh, I think that in Slovenia as well, in general, um, English being the language of the moot courts, um, we, our students typically do not have any particular problems with the language. Um, they, they want to, to practice, to improve their English. So um, basically we, 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 we do not feel um, inferior to, to, to you American teams or other native speakers. Mm -hmm. And our results also, also show that. So we, we just dive in and, and do it. <laughs> I could talk uh, a lot about my experience in mood courting, but I don't think we have the time for that. Well, David, one of the things, you know, if this is always in either, um, you know, Austria, well, there's the one in Austria and then the one in Hong Kong. Some of the other competitions do move around. Um, I know FDI has, is kind of on a rotating schedule that seems to increase more and more places that it's going to um, and then I know at U of H, we have, um, I think now two teams that go to Spanish speaking moots as well. So, I mean, I think it's been interesting to see some American students actually competing in moots in other languages. So, you know, maybe we're, there is kind of a transition point where, you know, there's more opportunity for other countries to lead and, and, it's not just 
I mean, I don't think it has been an American thing, but just like even we had a coach who's Brazilian and he told us all about all of their like national moots that they were doing there. So, you know, I think there are things just going on everywhere, not just the big, the big ones that Lorraine was talking about, the numbers. It's actually a great thing to encourage. Um, and when Lorraine was talking about, you know, the giant growth in participants, I wonder whether, I don't know that whether anyone's ever looked back at all the teams that participated and then looked at which teams were advancing and whether it's a diverse kind of array of teams or not might be an interesting thing to do. Um, some of you may know this already too, is that, you know, White and Case, the big sponsor of Jessup, I believe that they send the Russian team each year. And I don't know if that's the whole team or not, because typically these students argue more than one year and they, a lot of them go one year to observe and then the next year to compete. So pretty expensive uh, endeavor. But um, this is actually really interesting, sort of the, the outside, the financial and mm -hmm you know, political and diversity related issues about not just this competition, but others. And maybe we can, you know, have some project where we keep throwing information about competitions and, and the ones that you mentioned that, you know, maybe there's smaller ones or just within a school or whatever that develop those same skills. We kind of need to pull it all. You know, I actually think that the having to go online will be a game changer, right? I mean, you really, it's, it, yeah, it takes a lot of work and coordination, um, but it's, it really, I think, opens up possibilities for schools, regions, countries um, to, to become involved, if not, if not host. Um, and so I, I really do think that it will mean more opportunities uh, rather, than, rather than less uh, interesting challenges. I mean, we all know about the, the document that the Mood Court Listserv recently put out, trying to get through kind of all the nuts and bolts, but um, internationally with time zones and all kinds of, you know, there are different issues, I think, globally. Um, but I think the opportunities will only grow. And, and, and Anna and I had spoken earlier about the increase in the local and national and regional competitions. And Anna mentioned to me that, you know, most of those are much less rigorous than the super moods like uh, Jessup and Bees. Um, but students are clamoring towards that because they want both to learn the skills, but also to have something to put on their CVs. Uh, and it's a much easier get than Jessup or Bees. Okay. <laughs> well, it's been, it's been great talking to everybody and seeing everyone. Nice to see everybody. Thank you, everyone. Ciao. Nice to see everyone. Enjoy Thanks the so rest much. of the day. Bye, everybody. Bye bye. I'm going to say good night because. <laughs> <laughs> good night. 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 Good night.